former Prime Minister Liz Truss. Great to be on the show, Harry. Tell us all about it. Ten years to save the West. What are we saving the West from? Not well, what, from we're Liz saving, Truss. what we're saving the West from, ha <laughs> uh, What we're saving the West from is defeat. Yeah, I am worried that with the current trajectory, we are losing the war or losing the battle against authoritarian regimes, but also in our own countries, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, we're facing increasing takeover by left-wing ideas, whether that's extreme environmentalism, extreme wokery, socialism on the economy. You know, this is the danger, I think, and I think we're losing touch with what, what we should be about and what our way of life should be about. Is this a reflection of what you learnt from your experience in government, you know, a long time in government and then a short time at the top of government, or is this a sort of wider manifesto for another, another look at it? Well, this is, it is about what I learnt during my time as an MP in, go and in government and the forces that we faced. The deep because state you mentioned. Well, I, you can call it the deep state, you can call it the <laughs> quangocracy, you can call it the administrative state. But I think what's happened in Britain is that power that used to be in the hands of democratically elected politicians now lies in the hands of unelected bureaucrats, whether that's the Bank of England, whether it's the Office of Budget Responsibility, whether it's Natural England, the Environment Agency, or even the Post Office, you can see that too often decisions aren't being made by elected politicians who do, you know, for all their faults, get voted in and out by actual well, voters. You, you must have had you know, 14 years and the Tories have been in power. Whose fault is that that the, the balance has shifted away? Surely the people in charge are as, as to blame for that, for that as the mysterious people that you, know, you say are colluding against elected well, I politicians. Do, I, do, I do think that we are partly to blame, absolutely. And certainly when I came in as a new MP back in 2010, I don't think I realised the extent to which the Blair government had actually changed where power lay. Through so, for example, what, the Human Rights Act, the, like, yeah, Act, the but... Human Rights Act, but also things like the Constitutional Reform Act, where they created a Supreme Court. Mm. And we now have the government are trying to deport illegal immigrants, and they're being stopped from doing that by the Supreme Court, which is something Tony Blair created, or the Equality Act, which has essentially embedded identity politics into our laws. I don't. I put my hands up as a new MP in 2010 and as a government minister. I don't think I'd realised how much that Blairite change had made it harder for elected politicians to get things done. And of course, it, we made it worse in some ways. So I think how? the office of... Bod well, establishing the office of budget responsibility was a massive mistake. Shifting power away from the Chancellor to the Resolution Foundation. So. Essentially, yes. You, know, <laughs> you have people who used to work at a left-wing economic think tank now deciding how much money the Chancellor has for tax cuts or spending or whatever. But you you, you know more than anyone that trying to, um, I was going to use a ruder word there, but I'll say mess with yeah. things like the OBR and the sort of normal way of doing things, the uh, sort of... The status quo. The status quo ends in tears pretty quickly. So... Well, it did end in tears for me. What? That's certainly true. Yeah, so how is anyone... It doesn't look like Keir Starmer, who's looking likely to be the next Prime Minister, is going to change any of this. But anything, no, he would make it worse. So, he, would, so, he, he, has, he has actually said on the record he's going to make it worse. So he has said... <laughs> so what's the plan? That all the things that aren't working in Britain, he's going to turbocharge them. So, so that is not so ten years a recipe to save the for West. success. Ten years to save the country. Does not involve Keir Starmer. It's not just about the United Kingdom because we've also seen the same tendencies in the US. So let's take one issue, mm -hmm. which is uh, the use of hormone blockers for the under 18s, yeah. the gender ideology. You know, that is something that no person in the, or very few members of the public actually support, but it's being promulgated in our schools, the idea there are 100 genders, you know, young teenagers have been encouraged to well, take seen puberty the, seen blockers. The results of the and the same thing has happened in the United States as well. So this isn't just a British phenomenon. What we're seeing across the West is people who aren't elected, but who have an agenda, are changing our societies in ways that people don't want to see. So 
saving the West is not just about what happens in Britain, it's also about what happens in the United States. And it's about conservatives actually fighting back against left-wing ideology because we've allowed the left to win in many areas. And I mentioned <laughs> one, which is this gender ideology, but it's also true on things like the net zero agender. It's true on human you rights and immigration. You sat, you sat in a cabinet. I sat in a cabinet sat, for many years. You sat I've in a cabinet time. that signed off the net zero agenda without a price tag on it. And, you know, it was a plucked off the shelf by a prime minister on the way out looking for a legacy. And, you know, Philip Hammond, your old mate, says it had a trillion, trillion pound bill that no one's talked about. So on that one this? point, on that one point, I agree with Philip Hammond, mm. which is that was a mistake. It was a mistake retaining the Climate Change Act that Labour put in and the Climate Change Committee. And essentially, we have kowtowed to the left. You know, there were Conservative cabinet ministers. So you spent ministers. time in government, cabinet kowtowing to the left? I spent time fighting. And you will read in every detail of all the battles yes, I had well, in my got, book. We've got to update the paperback of Inclu our version, so we're, I'm looking forward to it. Including a chapter called A Hostile Environment, where I talk exactly about these battles that we were having mm. with the environmentalists on the left. And I think too many conservatives went along with these arguments rather than fighting them. It just does seem a little bit, I don't know, there's a bit of a disconnect between your 14 year career in, in, in parliament so far. And, you know, suddenly now once it's all gone a bit south saying, well, it's all the fault of this shadowy conspiracy of Quango that's not what the book. That's not what the book says. You know, I, I'm very clear that you know, first of all, when I went into government, mm. you know, I was more optimistic about trying to change things within the system. And you had it. I thought, and and out of you. I had it beaten out of me. And the the more senior I got, the harder I realised it was. We'll talk about. And you know, particularly my experience in the Ministry of Justice, where I was beaten around the head by the judiciary. You, you know, <laughs> was a you was a learning. Picked a fight with them, though, didn't you? I picked a fight with them because. They were doing things that I mm. felt were not were not right, and yeah. I felt the judiciary was not accountable enough. In the same way as I feel that the economic establishment is not accountable enough for for what they do. So I am somebody who is prepared to take on the status quo. You know, has it always gone perfectly? No, it hasn't, and I'm totally honest about that in mm. my book. But my point is, unless we do that, unless we are prepared to take this stuff on we will find it very, very hard to implement conservative policies. And I have lots of people say to me, hey, why is it, Liz, that we have had a conservative government in power for 14 years, and yet you know, we haven't stopped illegal immigration? Well, you know, we, well, haven't hey, dealt, we haven't dealt with the, you know, the issues of transgender. I think one part of it is conservatives not being prepared to fight the left enough and essentially meeting them halfway. And part of it is that the bureaucracy is much more powerful than it used to be. And there's no doubt about that, that if, if governments in the 70s and 80s had faced the same type of bureaucratic constraint and legal constraint mm. as we do now, they would not be able to have got the things done they what, did. What would you do differently if you, had, if you had it all over again? And we'll talk about what the future in a minute, but if you had it all over again, what would you have done differently as a minister? Apart from take the Queen's advice and slow down a bit. Well, I think the, the, the big issue around the mini budget, which I still believe was right, you know, I believe if the mini budget had remained in place... W weren't you trying Britain's... to do five years' worth of economic reform in 15 minutes, though? No. All I was trying to do is not raise corporation tax was the main measure in and this cut, budget. And cut the problem tax is... and cut national insurance and various other measures that weren't really that trailed during your campaign. Well... In the campaign, I'd explicitly said I was going to get rid of the health and social care levy. But you didn't I'd say specifically you were going to cut said, the top rate of, of corporation tax on the eve of the Labour conference, giving them the biggest. I think you mean the. I think goal. you mean the top. Sorry, rate top rate of, of income, income, tax. income tax. Yes. The big issue was once we announced the mini budget. Is first of all, the governor of the Bank of England the night before announced he was selling forty billion pounds worth of gilts mm -hmm. and didn't raise interest rates as much as expected. So the market was disappointed by that, but also. On the Monday, it became clear that we had a massive issue with LDI's liability-driven yep. investments. And that was what created the really difficult scenes in the market because those pension funds then had to try and fund cash calls. And 
if you ask me what, you know, knowing what I did now, you know, that you there was this massive, known? massive tin box. You know, the Bank of England governor ought to have dealt with that issue. So you know Andrew have, Bailey more than your own side? I believe that Andrew Bailey has a large share of the blame, yes. Have you told him that? I'm telling him that now. Very good. Andrew Bailey, if you're listening, watching, please do join us and another time. So do you... And, and by the way, just, just on this, you know, mm. I am constantly getting trashed in the left-wing media about, you know, my failings. And I totally admit that I've got failings, but what scrutiny has Andrew Bailey been placed under yeah. about his role in this? What scrutiny has he been placed under about the LDI scandal, which he presided over? Do you and, buy... the, you know, this guy has paid twice as much as a prime minister much harder to sack than a prime minister, and yet the media put very little scrutiny on him. Do you buy the idea that there was also a kind of unprecedented intervention from, some people say, the IMF, um, obviously sacking Tom Scholar on day one, the permanent secretary of the Treasury sort of upset that particular bit of the... If you're not prepared to check, you know, if you're not prepared to take people on and try and change the status quo, what's the point of being prime minister? Some of your supporters say that Scholar was, had a hand in getting the IMF to publicly slag you. Well, I, I've got no idea what went on behind the scenes. What I know is that we've had an economic establishment in Britain, the Treasury, the Bank of England, and more recently, the OBR, that have presided over a period of stagnation. That's the result of the policies that have been pursued. And what I know from being a Treasury minister for two years is the whole structure makes it very, very difficult for ministers to change those policies. And I consciously went in, and I described this in my book, I consciously went in with Kwasi Kwarteng trying to change those policies and do things differently. And I think it's perfectly reasonable for the prime minister and chancellor to choose who they want running a department. Well, it feels I just... like you're here to settle some scores finally. You're, you've, you know, you've gone away, you've licked your wounds, you've come back, and now you're ready to start throwing some punches. I still want to change things. From the that's what, that's what, not necessarily. But I, still I keep want reading to... that you and Priti Patel are forming a dream team where she'll be leader of the opposition and will be the shadow chancellor, is that? I, I don't have any sort of preconceptions about what, what I'm going to do in the future. I'm not looking beyond the next 10 months. Out. I don't rule anything out. Why so rule anything out in this? you would see a return uh, to You'd like to see a it's return. Not, to it's that. not top of my list of things to do. Not top of your list. It wasn't. But it wasn't an entirely. It wasn't years. an entirely painless experience, to be honest, Harry. So you know, I don't want to. I went into that job because I felt things needed to change. That mm -hmm. people had voted for change in 2016. They'd voted for change in 2019. I wanted to deliver that. Frankly, I did not have enough support from either the Conservative Parliamentary Party, and I had a lot of resistance from the establishment in trying to enact those policies. What I now see, and this is why I use the mm. phrase bigger bazooka, is that we need a much more powerful coalition of people who are ready to actually try and achieve that change. That presumably doesn't, in, that includes factors, forces outside of the Conservative Party. Last time I saw you, you were having a very nice time at Nigel Farage's birthday. I think you were as well, I Harry. think everyone had a nice time. Um, <laughs> The right is splintered in this country. You're looking at uh, a, a Keir Starmer premiership by hook or by crook, whether it's a massive majority or a majority, if the polls would be believed. Um, how are you going to bring that together? If you say that, you know, this big bazooka, that going to need Nigel Farage in that, isn't it? But the core thing has to be, what platform are we actually fighting on as Conservatives? That's the core thing I'm trying to address in my book. And what I'm trying to say is it's not enough just to have the right policies on tax or the right policies on immigration or the right policies on, you know, taking on wokery. We're going to have to actually change the way British government works if we're going to deliver conservative policies because there has been a takeover of our institutions by the left. Do that you... is the reality of the situation. And that is what I'm trying to say to everybody who's involved in politics. By the way, I would like Nigel Farage to join the Conservative Party. I think the Conservative Party is the party that can do this. We just need to be a lot more honest with the public about what the problems we face as a country are. And we need to be a lot clearer about the solutions. And if there's one you know, lesson from, from what I tried to do, 
you know, I tried to do that with very little preparation time, mm. with only two years to go to a general election. And what I now realise is the forces aligned against me were so powerful that you need more of a run up. So about you ten, need about more ten of a years, you'd say. well. And I'm not just talking about the UK. I'm talking about what's happening in the US as well. What I fear is if we don't get our act together as the West, it, we will see the likes of China, Russia and Iran dominating the world. You know, the, the biggest fear I have is US losing reserve currency status and what that would mean. I think there are, if the West doesn't start growing economically, defending itself better and projecting itself more strongly in the world, I think, think we're really struggling. Do you think Rishi Sunak gets that? He's currently fighting calls to increase defence spending. He sat in that chair exactly where you were um, not long ago and said that he would countenance leaving the ECHR. Is that something you would do? Do you think yes. he's doing enough? Would I you... think we need to leave the ECHR, but I don't... With or without a referendum? No more referendums, please. No more referendums. I agree with you. But you'd need a massive mandate from the people to do that. You, you know? would, but it's not enough just to leave the ECHR. What else do you need to leave? We've got to abolish the Supreme Court. Bring it I back into the Lords? or Yes, and bring it back into the Lords. I presume the OBR is pretty high on your hit list as well. That's definitely... <laughs> although, and, and what the OBR do with their modelling is they actually encourage governments to have higher immigration yeah. because they essentially try and force governments to trade off tax cuts for immigration rises. So, but the other thing, we've got to leave the ECHR abolish the Supreme Court and abolish the Human Rights Act. So just we, it back out. Yeah, so... And what, the British Bill of Rights? I think the Tories tried to do that for three or four times in the last... I prefer well. the traditional Bill of Rights that it's always... <laughs> I mean, Britons, sure. Britons have been free for many, many years. The idea that human rights were only invented in 1997 is a Blair fiction. One of the all that all that he's invented is rights for people that shouldn't be in our country. One of the one of the uh, sort of most totemic moments where you know pe the the public can see Britain coming up against the ECHR, grounding of flights of Rwanda, big issue this week. What is you know it, is that a policy you think is ever going to get off the ground? Ever going to work? Would you have kept it if you'd been in power? I believe it's a good policy. I think we should expand it to more countries rather than solely Rwanda. But it's, it's fundamentally a good policy. It's based on the policies the Australians use to deter uh, illegal immigrants. The problem is it's being blocked by the courts. Mm. That is the problem. This is what I'm saying, that we don't have a judiciary that is sufficiently accountable. And so a bit like when we left the EU, but still ended up do with... I think it's fine. I think it's a good idea because you, you, you were never a big... You were never a mainer, but then I remember talking to you in the past about how you never really considered it to be a top 10 issue facing Britain. You know, the overregulation and taxation of this country is done domestically rather than from the EU. Do you still... Do you think it's been worth all the pain and hassle? I think it is a good thing that we've left the EU. But the problem is we've still got all the EU laws on our statute books and the EU mentality is still there. And you, so that, the you EU, link that back to the bureaucracy, or is that a yeah, is that a Russian it's, thing? It's, is that a deep, no, deep, it's to deep do state with, thing? Or? It's to do with the it's to do with the bureaucracy. So the bureaucracy still operates as if we were in the EU. Do you have? Well, and just, this is why I do think and and so do the courts. Do you have any sympathy with your successor, Rishi Sunak? Do you think he's similarly bound by a disruptive party from the other side, not the side that got rid of you, but the side that you know his you know that sort of support you? Um, do you think he's equally sort of cuffed in this mess that well, you, you, you set if up? You, if we go back to 2022 and the leadership election, my analysis of the situation was the status quo was not delivering mm. and that if we wanted economic growth, if we wanted to be able to face the electorate with the situation having, to, having improved, we needed to change things. His analysis was more status quo based. And you think and that's, he has, was has the, that changed in office? He was the Chancellor that increased corporation tax. Has that increased... changed in office, though? Do you, you know, you're a serving Tory MP. Do you think he has done enough to turn things around? Well, what I would observe is that, you know, we need to do more. We need to do more. That, that is why I'm saying that I think the, the arguments I made back in 2022 about needing to take on the economic establishment 
needing to take on the orthodoxy are still true. And the fact people voted for change, we haven't delivered enough change. You... And, and that is partly because there's not enough support for it on the Conservative benches. And I want to see more support for change. But this is going to take longer. This is going to take decades. You know, you're going to facing... Uh... Five years, potentially, of Keir Starmer, maybe 10. He's asking for a decade of renewal. Um, by the time, well, how are you going to do this? It's going to be too late. Surely, well, the, you know, the Tories the going down this one is... The first thing is... You know, that's it. ...is uh, convincing sceptical people, such as you, <laughs> Harry... <laughs> Naturally sceptical. ...that, that, that w we, have a, we have a problem in Oh, don't believe country. me. I, believe, I, I, I can see the problem. So I'm just you not believe sure what the solution is. Well, the solution... Part of the problem is... All of this Blairite inheritance, we didn't get rid of. We didn't deal with the Equality Act, the Climate Change Act, the Human Rights Act, the Constitutional Reform Act. It is now holding us back from implementing conservative policies. So one of the things I say in my book is we've got to repeal that. Yeah. And I'm not sure you would necessarily agree with that. I'll have to read the book, but um, just... <laughs> Excellent. Is that, to, I hope that's an endorsement. The Tories, go, <laughs> the Tories lose the election. Do you, do you feel any responsibility for the result that's come, clearly coming down the track for the, for the government? Well, I mean, all, all of the Conservative Party who've been in power, I mean, I don't want to sort of conduct a post-mortem. I want to fight the election yeah. and do as well as we can in the election. But, but fundamentally, what are the issues people are facing? The issue that people are facing is high cost of living, immigration, which is still a problem in terms of both legal and illegal immigration, and I would say on both of those issues, I tried to change things to make that situation better. You... So, you know, I don't regret trying to do that, but the, the forces, the what forces do, what against you, me... What do you regret? Great. Well, sometimes I regret running in the first place because <laughs> I just think it was... I was in a pretty impossible position trying to do that without enough support from the Conservative Parliamentary Party and with such resistance from the economic establishment, but I still believe it was the right thing for the country. The Queen, the Queen you write in your book, um, said, pace yourself. Do you wish she had? Well, I think, look, she's a very extreme, she was an extremely wise woman. Mm. And, you know, so, so on the ball and so uh, wise in what she said. I think I was in what a different... What else did she say? <laughs> Tell her. Well, she, Tell she, the she, she, well, she said... You know, she, she talked a lot about all of the issues that were going on, all of the issues in the PM's inbox. She was, I mean, she was amazingly across absolutely everything that was going on. Mm. And you know, I was just, when, when our meeting ended and she said, I'll see you again next week, you know, I absolutely thought that would happen. And I was, I was so shocked by what happened over the next... moment of... You know, national crisis essentially. We didn't, no one really had been through it as an adult in in this country, really in living memory for for a vast part of the country. Do you not think that moment of upheaval would have been better to take some time to reflect on that rather than chucking a few grenades around? It was it, it, the the difficulty was that we'd already had quite a long period of hiatus. Mm. You know, there were a lot of issues that had mounted in the inbox over the course of the leadership election. And you know, things like the energy prices expected to go up to £6,000. It did mean that we had to act quickly. And you know, my, my, very, you know, my view of politics, which might be different from some of my colleagues, is that people don't actually vote on the basis of what press releases the government puts out. They mm -hmm. vote on the basis of what my energy bill is, do I feel my life's getting better? Is my kid's school okay or not? You know, can I get an appointment on the NHS? And with only two years to go mm. and all these very serious issues mounting up, I thought it was really important to act quickly. And I'm not convinced that having waited longer would have changed any of the fundamentals because it wouldn't have made the Bank of England suddenly in favour of my policies or... Mm you know, parts of the Conservative Parliamentary all pension, Party. All that pension issue, um, any... I mean, any I, I look, issue? I've thought a lot about this and the, nobody has yet managed to lay out to me a, a path where these things could have been delivered. So my, my general conclusion was that I was in a pretty impossible position.
But, you know, I, maybe maybe the Harry Cole Premiership would have been different. I don't know. <laughs> we live in hope for that. Um, come back, yes or no? Front, uh, well, I'll come back like, on this show. Come back on the show. But <laughs> would you like to come it's back? Would you like? To, would you like to serve in office again in any capacity? No, I, I don't really want to you know, commit to anything at this stage. I'm. What I'm focused on is talking about. I think I have got quite a unique perspective, having spent ten years in government, having got right to the top, having had numerous battles in six yeah. different departments. And I want to I want to use that learning. I mean I think we call that on never mind the ballots. Not a denial. <laughs> <laughs> We're out of time. But former Prime Minister, one day Prime Minister again, or Chancellor under Pretty Patel perhaps. Liz Trust, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Harry.